The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, welcome and um, welcome to Think Small to Grow Your Business, Mastering Small Letters and Intricate Detail. My name is Alice Wolf and I'm the Marketing Communications Director for Madeira USA. We're going to talk today about a chance to change how your knowledge of these th threads will change your thinking about what you can do with embroidery thread. You're probably faced with design challenges all the time, and we feel that these five threads that we're going to talk about today will solve some of those problems and provide you with design alternatives to offer your customers. Why do we think it's a good idea for you to be comfortable using these threads? Well, they're going to give you the opportunity to offer your customers what maybe no one else in your area can. You'll be able to problem solve and achieve special effects that will establish you as a creative, innovative embroiderer. Um, and speaking of innovative, creative embroiderers, I'd like to segue right into our introduction of who will be joining us today, two very, very creative and innovative embroiderers. Eric Campbell is an award-winning commercial embroidery digitizer currently working with Black Duck in Albuquerque, New Mexico. With 15 years of experience, Eric is a prolific writer for several magazines in the decorated apparel industry and a speaker who shares his knowledge at many trade shows. Eric, welcome. Thanks for having me. Rich Medcraft is a familiar name around Madeira, USA. He began his company, Stitchwise Embroidery Design, 16 years ago. He's a problem-solving digitizer and commercial embroidery designer who works in Eagle Point, Oregon. Rich, welcome back. Thank you. Our goals today are simple. If you don't currently run 60 weight thread, we'd like you to leave with the inspiration and the courage to try it. If you already have mastered 60 weight, you still may be faced with the need to get lettering even smaller than three millimeters tall. There are some additional threads that you should know about. We've chosen five threads, and these are the ones that we'll be covering today, and they include our newest, Poly Neon 75. Today, um, Eric and Rich will be talking about Classic Rayon number 60, Poly Neon 60, Poly Neon 75, Metallic FS50, and our Frosted Mat. These five threads all share a lot of common attributes, even though they are unique unto themselves, but they all can be used for adding clarity, detail, highlights, and shadows. All of them are environmentally friendly with Okitech's approval, and many of them, um, actually most of them, are matched to 40-weight thread. Um, just guessing, though, we're thinking that maybe the first questions that might come to mind are, when should I use a thinner thread than 40-weight? What is it about a design or a graphic that indicates the need for a lighter weight thread? And with that question, the very original question, I think I'm going to turn the, our program over to Rich and Eric. Well, as most of you have probably encountered, it seems like um, everybody that uh, you, you get in the door seems like these days they want something smaller and smaller. And of course, our desire would be we'd like the embroidery larger and larger because we know that the larger elements are in embroidery usually the better the quality but uh, given the way things are and what people want uh, you have to try to accommodate them um, I have a lot of corporate customers that uh, bring me designs and they tell me what size they want it and I try to bump them up in size but I'm not usually successful so I have to turn to specialty threads like 60 weight um, when you get into small lettering, it's really helpful. When you get into certain small details, it's really helpful. I'm sure Eric has the same experiences that I've had. Absolutely, Rich. Uh, certainly with my corporate customers and with the rise of performance apparel, very sleek looks, people want smaller lettering, people want finer details. And when you really want to look for that 68 thread, especially if you have any kind of lettering under five millimeters, that's when you're going to want to start looking for it. I mean, up to five millimeters or a little bit under that, you can work with the 40 weight thread but the 68 thread is going to add a lot of clarity and allow you to go a lot smaller. Yeah, and especially now that we have the 75 weight to uh, add to the uh, arsenal here, it's really exciting what kind of detail and how small we can go with some of this lettering. 
Yes, it's really incredible. I mean, even just the samples we've seen so far, I'll show it to you, but later on in the program, we've got some samples that really should be surprising to people. Okay, well, let's uh, take a look at um, these threads individually, and let's begin with a classic rayon. Uh, I've always been a, a rayon enthusiast. I think it is the most beautiful thread there is. Uh, it has a classic sheen. It's, it's uh, uh, natural looking. It's not sort of a plastic shine. It's really pretty. And I guess if you're doing embroidery for the sake of art, and in a lot of cases some, some designs you do are that, um, I think rayon's the, the, the uh, thread of choice. Uh, but there's a lot of other reasons why I like uh, rayon. One is that it's really easy to use as far as setting tensions. Um, I have found that the classic rayon tensioning is um, the easiest thread there is to do. It's um, uh, smooth and steady and consistent. Uh, I just love the, the way the stuff runs. Um, because it runs in, uh, also with lighter tensions, it actually means it puts less stress on your garment. So those of you maybe who are suffering with puckering issues, you know, like on some of this performance piquet and stuff, I think you'll find that rayon is, is really friendlier for, uh, for embroidering on that. Um, I think rayon tends to get kind of a, a bad reputation in some cases because uh, people think that people are going to bleach everything. Uh, and so they're worried that rayon thread, of course, won't handle bleach. But uh, you can look through your closet, and I'd almost guarantee that there isn't a garment that you have in your closet that, that doesn't have a tag on it that says, do not use bleach <laughs> when you're washing it. So in a lot of respects, you can use classic rayon. It's just um, not suitable for, obviously, some things, like where there's industrial cleaning and things like that. But uh, that being said, uh, I was really excited when a 60-weight uh, thread came out in the rayon because, um, again, it's matched to, like, 82 other... 40 weight colors. So a lot of times I might have a design where I've got um, situations where I really don't need to use 60 weight thread. You can use regular thread. Like for example, on that little yellow MG you see down there, that car, uh, the yellow there is obviously just 40 weight thread. There's really no need to use 60 weight, even though I could have. But uh, where it really shines is when you use it for small detail. Like for example, I used the in the black stitching on the car. Um, it was wonderful for it because um, it is so fine, it, uh, it, you can create those little spokes in the wheels and the, and the grill slats. Uh, I could have used 40 weight thread, but they would have, the spaces between the little spokes would have had a tendency of closing up, so it wouldn't look nearly as sharp and as nice as it does here. Um, as with all uh, these finer threads, you'll want to use a finer needle, and, and the advantage to that, of course, is you're you're using a smaller penetration, needle penetration hole, so you can put your stitches actually a little closer together um, and achieve just much sharper detail because of that. Um, you can get lettering down to three millimeters high. Obviously, um, we'll talk about that um, and, and what you can do that on and uh, you know, the advantages of uh, going small. Um, but as you can see, like in the design upper right corner there that Bonnie Nielsen did, I mean, look at the detail in that black stitching. It's just amazing. And, uh, and, the, and the design below, of course, shows these really, really thin lines. Um, and all this is done with 60 weight thread. And uh, I encourage you to, to try it for yourself, and you'll see what I mean. Um, you can use a size 9 needle, uh, like I said earlier. I tend to, uh, when I'm doing caps, I might actually go up to size 10 needle. So know that you have some flexibility there. As with all 60 weight thread, because it's finer, you can increase your density. So usually I, the rule of thumb is about 20%. So uh, you can increase your densities that far. Now um, here's a couple more examples of rayon thread and 60 weight. Uh, this design that Bonnie did I think is nothing short of amazing. It, it really adds a true uh, artistic look to this, um, this figure. And it almost looks like whoever did this design, it, it's not like it's even embroidered. Uh, it's like somebody took this really fine tip marker and sketched it out. It's so beautiful. Um, the little thin lines being the thread, of course, uh, are just so realistic. Uh, the design on the right, um, I just did for the Survivor program uh, for in Cambodia that's coming up. And um, while not all of it is obviously 60 weight, I used it on some of the detail, like in the black uh, detail on the figures up above their little faces and in the trees uh, that you see there and also in the lettering. I, I'm really a fan for using it on small lettering. So um, it's 
it's a, a tremendous tool to have in your arsenal. And if you do not have it in your arsenal, I really think you ought to try it because um, I think you'll be amazed at how good, how much better your embroidery will look. Rich, a question that just came in um, from one of the people that are, are attending. What is a 3.5 density converted over to Wilcom? Well, I, there is a scale that you can use in Wilcom. Um, I prefer, in Wilcom, they use a density setting called auto spacing. Um, it's an automatic feature that Wilcom uses to uh, automatically vary the density depending upon the width of the column that you're creating. But to answer your question, um, I run 60 weight thread at about 75% um, auto spacing. Uh, if that helps you, I don't know if some of you, uh, if you're using Wilcom, if you're not familiar with auto spacing, I encourage you to use it. It is like probably the best uh, feature of Wilcom. I just want to take a moment to encourage people to write their questions in. While we may not have the opportunity to answer everyone during this hour, we are going to collect all of them, um, answer all of them, and we'll be sending the emails out to you with all the questions and all the answers. So please do continue to, um, to write your questions in. One point I'd like to make also, and I think Eric's going to bring it up a little later too, is um, I encourage you to do some testing on your own. So make a column uh, that is really narrow, like a one millimeter, one and a half millimeter, and uh, try various densities. You know, duplicate it, have a whole bunch of those columns on, on, a, on a design, and then change densities from one column to the next, and look for yourself and see which looks the best to you. Uh, that's what I would encourage. I think Eric would call it calibrating, which is Absolutely. basically, you know, basically the, what you're doing is you're getting your mind tuned into what is the best setting to get the best performance out of this thread. You can't beat that experience, Rich. You really have it right there. Yeah. Here's a couple of examples here of, uh, of doing a sew out, showing both 40 and 60 weight. Um, and while this picture, it's kind of hard to show a picture on, on, a, on a computer screen here, but I'll point out some things that really, really show why the classic Rayon 60 is so effective. And, and also the polyneon would do the same. Uh, in the small lettering, you'll see uh, on the left, the small e in Adela and the small u in Duncan. Uh, the biggest problem we have in small lettering is the small openings tend to close up and it's a constant battle that we have and there's a, a rule of one millimeter I'll talk about later on in the program but basically what happened here is you can see that it closed up on the e and the two columns in the u kind of got squished together there and then you look over to the right and here's the same design sewn with 60 weight and look all of a sudden that little opening in the e is visible and the columns between the in the letter u are separated now so you get a little more space there it's a real subtle little difference but I'll tell you what, this makes a huge, huge improvement when you're looking at obtaining the very best quality small lettering. And when you're doing um, corporate lo logos and stuff, I mean, the, I hate to say it, but the most important thing on the entire logo is going to be the text or the lettering that uh, states the name of the company. And they want that to look absolutely as perfect as possible. And this thread allows you to do that. I think that, Rich, when you would compare these two, I think the faces are also very revealing. The woman on the left looks like she's wearing lipstick, and the woman on the right is not. So it's another <laughs> difference. Yeah. yeah, that's true. The that's same thing with the eye, the hair, the surface quality. It really does add something to it and add some fineness and quality to the lines. I uh, equate the difference between 60 weight thread is is if you took a regular Sharpie felt pen marker and you drew something with it, and then you switched and you went to an ultra fine tip marker and you tried doing the same thing. I mean, it's just like night and day what you can create with it. You know, that's funny. It's a tip I used to always use for lettering is to tell people, hey, take a new crayon out of the box, and that's about as small as you'll be able to draw with a standard 40-weight thread. That's about as small. If you can write lettering clearly with it, that's how it's going to be. But with the 60-weight, it kind of throws my little example right out. You're right. It's like using a sharpened pencil instead. <laughs> And now we can see Poly Neon 60. I mean, uh, Rich has already talked about 60 weight thread extensively with the Rayon 60, but the Poly Neon is really great for people who need to run polyester. Now, uh, certainly, though not everybody's going to do commercial laundering, I know people like us here at Black Duck, we do a lot of work for uh, the hospitals. For, so for the medical industry, 
Uh, there's a lot of industrial laundry going on there. There's commercial laundry. There's bleach. There's everything you can imagine. And we do things for uh, certainly a lot of plumbing companies. And I always think, well, they're definitely going to launder those garments pretty hard. Uh, for the for that sort of treatment, you're going to want polyester. And so uh, the Poly Neon 60 is going to be the way to go. It's great for that. It's great for sports apparel. It's great for any kind of uniform you're going to run. Um, the same densities apply here. Uh, it says it's a 3.5 density, and actually being a Wilcom digitizer myself, though I also use that auto setting quite a bit, uh, that would be a 0.35 is what that should come out on Wilcom. Move that decimal point over and you've got it. Uh, same consideration for the needles that Rich talked about. You're going to want to use that finer needle. And the great thing, once again, is that you've got these matched to those poly neon 40 colors so that if you have parts of the uh, logo that don't need to have the 60 weight and you don't want to increase your stitch count, you can keep the stitch count low on the fills and still use that 60 weight match to it to do the fine lettering and the fine detail. Um, Eric, a, a quick question. Um, does, sure. a, does a 60 needle, when you switch to a 60 needle, do you need to adjust the timing on your machine? Um, I didn't have any trouble with it. I know some people are much more particular about their timing, but when I was running it and when we have run it, I haven't had any trouble. Okay, thank you. Your mileage may vary. Like I said, you know, do testing. And with any of these things, I would encourage anybody, do testing. It's not something that's going to cause you to go haywire generally. You know, it's a very small change, but test for your machine. Not all machines run exactly the same, but to be really honest, in testing this stuff, and I honestly had not done as much work with it as I've done in preparation here, especially with the brand new things like the 75 we're going to talk about later, I was surprised at how little trouble I had. Um, once tensions were dialed in, everything run, ran pretty well and pretty much as expected. Um, kind of to, to fret onto that question, though, about setting that machine timing. I know my machine tech, uh, when he sets my machine up, he sets sort of a happy medium uh, for all the th needles that I would be using. And, and, and I think there's a tolerance there that will cover easily because I've never had any trouble with it. Um, using a 9 needle or a 75-11 or going all the way up to a 12 on occasion. Well, and as I always say, it's kind of it's kind of like I say, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to say certainly that I'm not a tech. It's not not something that I do. But I agree, I haven't had any trouble with it, and I think that that happy medium is true. There's some tolerance there. Um, to show some examples that we have on the page here, you can see that in the design by Pat Williams over on the right. She's really managed to capture a lot of detail in those small bugs, and this design is something that you can test. You know, we talked about calibrating. <laughs> That's my word, and Rich said, you know, doing some self testing. Um, that design is available on Madeira's website. If you want to test out this thread, go get some of those designs that are digitized for it, since there is some special digitizing densities that, are, that go into this. Get those designs, put them on your machine, test the 60 weight, test the small needles, and that will give you a baseline to see how things are running. And on the, the uh, logo that's on the bottom left hand there, that's something that I did. And it's for one of our customers who's incredibly picky. Uh, Boba Tea Company, they love really, really clean, really fine, very small logos. You can see there that logo is about two inches wide. That lettering is well under that five millimeter limit. As you can see, that's a standard USB plug sitting in there for scale. Um, we did umpteen versions of this logo for the folks at Boba Tea, and though they were happy with each one of them, every time they just said, hey, can we get 5% smaller? Hey, can we get 5% smaller? You know I'd really like it smaller. And so on this latest run, uh, you can see on this, on this knit, and it was actually um, a knit that wasn't always easy to embroider. This came out really clean. So the uh, Poly Neon 60, for people who do run polyester all the time, you're going to find that it runs a lot like the polyester you used to, but uh, with a much finer uh, sort of aspect. Even in the logo above, I could have used the 40 weight, but these people like such a fine, clean edge that I went with the 60 weight both in the logo and in the text. Eric, when uh, another question that came in, when you're adjusting the top tension, do you need to adjust the bobbin, Is the bobbin tension as well? Um, you know, I, I didn't do very much adjustment, I'll admit. I kind of do a little bit by feel. Uh, Rich is definitely a gauge guy, and he might have better numbers than I do. <laughs> because though, I, though I do use gauges, and uh, I tend to be the person who sets the machines up with gauges in the first point, my, my techs in the back tend to be the kind of pull and feel folks. And so when they were running, I don't think that we had numbers that they were hit, aiming for. They were doing testing and checking instead. Okay. Thank Rich, <laughs> do you I, have any? I, well, I was just going to say that I usually set my bobbin tension and 
um, and I forget them. I, I don't mess with them too much on, on occasion. I mean, after each run, I'll look at the back side of the embroidery, and if, if I see something a little, little funny, I'll maybe I'll adjust, make a slight adjustment in the bobbin tension, but usually you set that and forget it, and it's the upper thread tension that you pay attention to. So I guess the answer is no. I, I would set your bobbin tension the way you normally do, which I use a, a TOA gauge, which is a, a special gauge. You put the bobbin case with bobbin in it, and you pull on it, and Depending upon your machine, some machines um, like a little bit lighter t tensions than others. Um, my Tajimas tend to like it a little tighter. So my bobbin tensions, I'll run between 20 and 24 grams. Um, I know some people can get theirs down to 18, and it's really whatever uh, works the best for your particular machine. Obviously, if you're embroidering on a cap or something like that, you're going to want to tighten both your bobbin and your top thread tensions because uh, that's the way caps embroider best. But rule of thumb, no, don't, you don't need to really make any special adjustments. Okay. Yeah, I've found that the biggest problem you have is when you have quality issues, you can check it. And that's really where it happens. You're going to do some testing. And when you do that testing, you'll see what's going on with the bobbin. Truthfully, if you keep your bobbin clean, <laughs> that's going to be the best thing you can do. Keep that spring clean and keep everything maintained well, and it should be fine. Absolutely. One question that came in that's easy that I can answer. Um, someone wants to know if don't bug me is all 60 weight. And the answer to that is yes. Um, Pat was able, as, as Eric pointed out, <clears throat> to achieve some personality in these little critters that um, she wouldn't have been able to with 40 weight. So um, as Eric said, again, this is um, available on our website as a free downloadable design for you to try 60 weight. Um, the entire Don't Bug Me design is done in 60 weight. All right, what we're seeing here are some more examples of the Poly Neon 60, but as you can see from the tagline at the bottom, these are designs done by Rich himself, so I think I'm going to turn it over to you, Rich, and have you answer a little bit about why you chose 68 for these and what it did for you. Okay. Well, as we've talked about before, our, our companies, our corp corporations or uh, customers typically are asking for smaller and smaller designs, and uh, the one on the left, Mrs. Cubison's, they're uh, a national company that um, pro they actually make uh, stuffing for, um, and their main market time is, of course, around Thanksgiving. But anyway, they sent me this design. They said, I want this on the front of a cap. And, of course, the graphic designer, she sends me this picture of a cap and this, you know, this little logo on it. And, of course, the first thing I do is I bring the design into my graphic program and then start measuring, and I'm thinking, boy, this is pretty small. And so I thought, okay, instantly I knew right away I was going to use 68 thread. But in any case, I tried to talk her into going larger, and no, they had absolutely, for whatever reason, had to have it this small. So anyway, I went ahead and sized it, and then I made my measurements to make sure that it would be even work at that size, and then I proceeded accordingly. Now, most of you out there, i, I got to tell you, probably the, the biggest thing that I hate the most and most people can agree to this, is white thread on a black background. If there isn't anything worse, I don't know what is. And because the reason for that is that white, because of that contrast, um, white really reveals the tiniest flaws. So as you know, embroidery is not a perfect uh, science. Nothing, I mean, it's not like printing where we're putting ink on these caps. It's thread. And unfortunately, the slightest little miscue or, or change or whatever, and it'll, it'll magnify itself really, really more than you'd like with white thread. Well, this 60-weight thread, um, one reason why I chose poly neon is, again, it's on, this, on a cap. And so it's a little stronger, a little bit more friendly for production. Uh, my first order on these caps was 100 of these caps, and I did it all on my Tajimas, and so I didn't want to have any problems. And i got to tell you, this thread ran beautifully with very, very few thread breaks. And that's saying a lot because these caps, if anybody's embroidered on FlexFit, they can be a test because they have these uh, stiff buckrams in them and they're a little kind of hard to hoop and whatnot. But anyway, it uh, came out real crisp and clean, and my customer was thrilled, and I was glad when the job was done. Uh, <laughs> and I'm expecting to do more. The one on the right... Um, I chose to use the white uh, thread 60 weight in the detail on the bear there. Um, and again, some of those columns that make up that little detail are really, really thin. And while I could have done it with, with 40 weight, it just looks so much sharper using that 60 weight. And by the way, um, I'm such an uh, enthusiast for 60 weight thread. I hate to tell people this, but I use it even in larger lettering and, and things. I, I could have used it on the BCB part there. Uh, I chose not to. But um, you can see, actually, on the bottom right close-up picture, 
that the 40 weight on the right, I probably would have been better off using 60 weight because it's a little rough around the edges there. Again, white on black reveals all the, the most the slightest de detail flaws uh, that, and, and magnifies it. So uh, that's why I like this thread. It, it worked really well. It's great for production, runs smoothly, um, very little hassle, and it's not expensive either. It's great, great thread to have in your stock. Rich, what size needle did you use with these caps? I used the size 10. Um, okay. I, I tend to go up a little bit. Like if you can use a size 9, especially on your knits and things, it's great. Um, obviously, the smallest needle penetration you can uh, make is, is the best. That's your goal. But when you're doing a cap, um, especially with a buckram and there's flagging that tends to go on sometimes, that's where the, the crown of the cap tends to bounce up and down between the uh, throat plate and the cap crown. Uh, initial, it usually happens on the very initial part of the design. So once you get the first part of the design sewn, that's not a problem. But nonetheless, those things tend to um, uh, cause more needle breakage problems. So if you go up with a little bit he uh, heavier needle, like the size 10 sharp is what I used here, uh, then it, it, you don't have as much problems with it. Okay, and here we have some examples of the Polyneon 40 versus the Polyneon 60 and the Frosted Mat 40. Um, you can see in this comparison very quickly how much different this lettering turned out. Over there in the bottom left, that Polyneon 40, uh, it's a little lumpier. The holes in the top of the B, the top of the A, they're entirely closed. It doesn't look very clean. You get over to the Polyneon 60, however, and even though we haven't had a lot of change there, you get a, a much smoother finish. It's less lumpy. The, the edge quality is better throughout. And then the holes start to open up and get some airspace, despite the fact that they're so, so small. And then over there on the right, you see the Frosted Matte 40, which we're going to talk about later. Um, that matte finish is very interesting. One of the good things about it is it does kind of lend some surface quality and some uh, consistency. It runs a little thinner than the other 40 weight. And you can see how just that little bit of thinness uh, smooths out the N, smooths out the D. There's less lumpiness going on, and it does open up the letters just a bit. So it's interesting how we're going to talk about this later, but that frosted mat does tend to run a little thinner, a little crisper, if you don't mind losing the shine or if it's desirable for you to lose the shine. Eric, a question that keeps coming in, um, actually we've seen it about three times, uh, when you switch top thread from 40 to 60, do you have to change the bobbin thread? Uh, I didn't, and I haven't had any trouble with it. Um, later on, we talked about the 75. I found that the 75 was so thin that I wanted to run very uh, a very dense line, and when I did it, I actually self-wound my own bobbin 75. Now, I don't know if that's exactly what you guys <laughs> recommended, Madeira, and if you have some more tips, I'd love to hear them. But certainly on the 75, I was a little concerned with that, and so I did back it down. But on the 60 weight, I haven't. Uh, Rich, what's your experience with that? Actually, that's the first I've ever heard of uh, actually um, using a different uh, bobbin itself. I, I really haven't. I've used just standard bobbin. Um, I have a particular bobbin that I like to use all the time, and um, and it just runs real consistently. And I, I have really never given it any thought to changing the bobbin type for uh, ch when I use 60 weight thread, no. A bobbin, yeah, I did this, sorry, go ahead, Eric, oh, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, both with the 60 weight and with the Frosted Matte 40 especially, I mean, I didn't think of it whatsoever, and I didn't have any trouble with the density on the backside. The pre-wound bobbins are a, a lighter thread than 40 weight, so you are absolutely safe going with um, standard bobbins for 60 weight. Great. This stitch out, um, I'm just going to jump in here uh, just for a second to introduce our 75 weight. Uh, one of our, Bonnie Nielsen, one of Madeira, Germany's designers, uh, was challenged with um, 75 weight thread. They wanted to see if she could create um, letters that were smaller than three millimeters on, um, on a piquet knit fabric, which would be your basic golf shirt. Um, she rose to the challenge. She managed to use several different fonts and she used them to explain exactly how she accomplished this. Um, she used a density of three. She was able to um, get these letters to appear two and a half uh, millimeters tall. She used a size 60 needle uh, or an eight if it's the, the US uh, measurement. And she did use a water soluble topping in order for uh, the letters to stay on top of the fabric. So this was um, 75 weight is our, is our newest product. Eric and Rich have both tested it, and we'll be talking about it a little bit more. But this was, um, when you see this stitch out in, in real life, it's, it's pretty amazing. 
And here's a sample that I did for the 75 weight. And uh, as you can see, it's incredibly small. There's a kind of work that I tend to do a lot of, which is this sort of wood cut or engraving work. And I've been sought out to do that single color work quite a bit. Um, and with the 75 weight, we're looking at a logo that used to be about three inches in diameter when you're talking about what I did with 40 weight. But here you can see it next to a dime. It's much smaller than that now. Um, the thing that I'll say about the 75 weight that was surprising isn't just the fineness because admittedly I was gobsmacked when this came off of the machine, how small everything was and how clean and clear it was. But it's actually that it wasn't that hard to run. I didn't find any thread break trouble. I didn't have any trouble with uh, any of my tensions really. Once the tensions were locked in uh, up to spec, it was fine. Um, and I did indeed use the needle, the uh, size 8 or the 60 needle that was recommended for it, and it ran very well. Um, you can see those letters are far below the uh, five millimeter mark, especially in the of and of pediatrics down there, and that the detail was just very fine. I mean, it, it is very much like embroidering with hair. It's very sharp. Um, and with this thread, I've found that your textures are just really incredible. You can see in the shading there, the textures are great. The lines are very close together. And the strange thing about this too, I didn't digitize this originally directly for 75 weight. Um, in order to kind of torture test this material, I went ahead and took my original logo calibrated myself to the scale, which is to say I, I measured down from the density that I would have used for the 40 weight, shrunk it down and made very small changes. And as you can see, even without doing a lot of babying and uh, hand holding to get this to run, um, the details came out very clean. And what surprised me is what you see in the detail over on the right hand side, that detail shot shows you that the eyes and pupils stayed open at that size. I mean, I once again, uh, my, my wife is usually my uh, amateur photographer and partner in all of this, and, and despite years and years of taking shots of embroidery and having these samples in her house, she actually held on to the sample and didn't, wanted to show it to everybody because she was so amazed at how fine the lines were. So that'll tell you, somebody who's not an embroiderer who I'm sure is tired of hearing me talk about thread, uh, absolutely still loved the 75 and found it to be an amazing product. I bet she was amazed by this accomplishment also. One of our, our questions, Eric, was this keyboard lettering that you used on this logo. This particular letter, lettering is not keyboard lettering at all. No, this is custom lettering. And okay. um, part of that certainly is, is it was made, it's a very hand-tooled original font. You can see in the the over on the left-hand side how the T goes over the H there. It's a real particular logo and font. However, what I'll say later is we're going to look at some other examples where I did use keyboard lettering. You can edit keyboard lettering to get it to work with this stuff. There is a way to do it. Um, certainly, we're going to talk about underlay, we're going to talk about some other technical stuff later, so I won't go too deep, but you can use keyboard lettering with 60 weight and with, uh, I'd say even with 75 weight if you were calibrated correctly and if you do pay attention to underlay and do some manual editing. Do you tend to use um, like a water soluble topping with the 60 and the 75 or, or does it depend um, on the fabric? It depends on the fabric. This particular piece right here is uh, right out of a standard, like a bog standard dress shirt. A button-down dress shirt, it's a, it's like a twill, and I didn't use anything at all. But like I said, I used a normal backing, nothing I changed. I The only thing I did differently on this particular piece was I did I did wind a bobbin for it, um, just because it has some very dense areas that are even dense in the 40, and I wanted to have it a real clean finish and have a real nice hand. Because for me, hand, uh, the, the ability for the garment to flow and bend is really important to me, and I like, like I said, once, one of the reasons people bring me this stuff is because they like the lighter hand that I tend to bring. Eric, did you cut in or, or trim in between the letters on this logo? Yeah, uh, between the letters, no, and you can still see the letters have trims in between them, but between the dots and some of the words I did. Okay. You can still see the jump, the jump stitches between like the O and the dot on the bottom left hand there, between the A and the M at the top. I left those stitches in. Truthfully, the 75 is so fine that a single stitch, and especially, I mean, if you have, have this out of what I like to call the handshake distance, which, you know, when you're shaking somebody's hand, you're between three and, you know, five feet away from them, depending on how big you are and how far you're extending your arm, you would not see those trims. And so I tend not to trim things that I don't think need it. Yeah, I think a lot of people tend to put trims in where they don't need to, and especially in small lettering, it can actually make the design look worse by putting trims in because remember every time you trim not only does it slow the machine down it, it costs you about 75 stitches of time but it also you have to tie a knot at the end of where that before it trims and then you got to tie another knot these are tie in tie out stitches before they start well when you do that you're there isn't a whole lot of room especially in this really tiny lettering to make a little knot and so it turns into a blob and then it ruins the letter so to, by going from letter to letter and doing transition stitching like uh, Eric did here, that's the cleanest way to perform this. Oh, absolutely. And if it wasn't just about performance in uh, production, it does just look better. You are right. 
Um, now we've got some other samples here of the polyneon 75. These were done by Bonnie Nielsen in Germany. Um, and as you can see, the one that always gets me is on the right hand top there, that soccer player. Look how small that is. It's like it's an inch wide, the entire logo, and you've got a full you've got full detail in the face. You have a small logo on his shirt, so you've got a logo inception going on. Uh, you've got these fine lines in the hand and the fine lines in the soccer ball. Um, it's tremendous that you can get this kind of detail. Um, certainly not everything is going to you know, want that. You're not going to have this in every logo, but in the logos that do, in the artistic pieces, and especially with things like faces like that where people really gravitate toward them and can really point out when things are wrong. If you do a face and one of the eyes closes and the other doesn't, you can see that. If you do a face and the mouth smashes into the nose, you can see that. It's really identifiable to people. And in this piece, you can see how that 75 weight allowed that fine detail to show up. Um, also, you can see on the left-hand side, We've got these paisleys, and look at that. That's less than two and a half inches in the total height. And those flowers, as you see in the detail underneath, still maintain a little bit of openness, even in the smaller flowers with that 70 weight or 75 weight, um, which is something that's just incredible. If you're someone like me who does do a fair amount of that single color work, that engraving style work, uh, the 75 weight is just something incredible that you really couldn't see that kind of uh, detail through any of the other threads. Yes, um, so here we are. We're starting in on the FS Metallic 50 um, and 50 weight. And I have to say that when I first started in embroidery, I, I really kind of shied away from metallic. And I don't know about a lot of you folks out there, but metallics uh, can be a challenge because they are a, a little different to understand. Uh, usually when you do metallic uh, designs as a digitizer, I, you have to mess with it. You have to do lighter densities and longer stitch lengths. You uh, reduce the amount of underlay. You do a lot of fussing with it. And then once you get that all done, then to actually sew it using some of the heavier metallics, uh, you've got to change your uh, tensions on your machine, and you've got to worry about it getting wound up in the machine and caught. And some, my machine, my single head, really doesn't like to trim it very well. And so it's just kind of a pain. Well, I've got to tell you, this FS50 uh, weight is unbelievable. It is very, very friendly to use. And I now have, uh, I use this thread all the time when I want to add a little bling or something to corporate logos and things. Um, it, the reason why I like it so much is that it, you can literally just alternate it with a, a regular 40 weight thread that you've digitized like, um, and, and just see what it looks like and not have to mess with worrying about changing uh, uh, densities or stitch lengths or any of that kind of thing. Um, an example is uh, Pat Williams did this design on the right, which, by the way, you can also download and try for yourself, the Florida Lee. Um, and it's just beautiful. It just offers that kind of a um, bling and crispness that metallic offers. And yet, because it's a lighter weight like this, I think it runs. That's one of the reasons why it runs smoother. And again, you don't have to change anything in your, in your uh, densities or anything, so it just works. Um, the design I did on the bottom right corner there uh, is an angel that some of those columns are just a little over a millimeter wide and uh, you know it used to be boy you wouldn't even touch that with any typical metallic but with this FS50 uh, it had no trouble at all and trimming worked really well it tensions really nicely uh, again you want to probably use a size 9 or 10 needle on it if you need to uh, I mean for best results but uh, it just is a, an amazing thread to experiment with I have a corporate customers that typically will want to add, ha, offer, ha, have me offer them something a little unusual, especially around the holiday season. I have a winery, for example, that I just swapped a, a red metallic uh, 50 weight in, and uh, it was just amazing what it did to their logo, which was a little red lily. And uh, just that little bit of, of sparkle of the metallic uh, really set the logo off, and they really, really liked it and ordered a bunch of it because of it. Eric, with the Darby Fire Department, I don't think that you, when we were rehearsing, I think you mentioned that you didn't have to change anything in that um, digitizing. Is that true? Actually, I'll tell you a little bit more than that. I actually made it smaller. Uh, ah. This was something that was digitized for 40 weight thread at a much larger size. And what I ended up doing, once again, I wanted to torture test this stuff because if I'm going to say, hey, it works, I want to tell you that it works. And what I did, I shrunk this down so that I got that text down to where I felt like I was uh, – capable of running it at the 50 weight, but everything else I left the same. No differences on my tensions, bobbins, and I even cheated and I used a bad needle. I used a larger needle that I would have used for the 40 weight thread, <laughs> and frankly, it worked fine. Um, certainly, I would say, once again, follow the directions up here if you want the best, 
the best outcome, but I was surprised to find out that changing nothing on my machines, aside from very small edits that we're going to talk about later that I did to the lettering, um, everything was done just as this logo was originally digitized, but smaller, and it ran very well with the FS50. Uh, certainly, I upped my densities just a little tiny bit, because honestly, I wanted on this particular piece with that high contrast, kind of like that white and black we talked about before, sometimes on the metallic, you're, you really want to make sure you've got it tight. Um, on this one, I had that upped, and everything ran very well. Uh, the other thing I'm going to mention here, like I said, we're going to talk about editing things later, but this lettering here, that is keyboard lettering. That is Flares font right out of the Wilcom uh, stock fonts with some editing done to make sure that it stays open at this small size, which is um, definitely under 5 millimeters. I like this page. Everything on here is FS50. There's no other thread, and um, as everybody heard from two people that, that created them, um, no problems at all. A couple of people have written in that they joined us late and are asking about the availability later on of the information. Um, we want to share all this information with you in every single, single way you can think of. So um, we will have a recording. We are recording the webinar. We do have PDF um, uh, printable pages of it. So we will be making all this information as well as all the questions that you send in. We'll be assigning answers to them and sharing all that with you as well. So stick with us and also be aware that all the information will be um, available to you at the end. Let's take a look at a little bit more of the FS50. Yes, this was a design that um, I was asked, asked to do by the LPGA, the Ladies Professional Golf Association. Um, the Solheim Cup is actually the professional uh, ladies uh, uh, golf uh, tournament. Uh, uh, the comparable one in men's is called the Ryder Cup. So for those of you who are golfers out there, you'll know what it is. But in any case, I was uh, requested to do, th to do this design. And the, the main issue was a couple of them. One was the size, and uh, I think all, almost all golf designs um, are really tiny for some reason. They just, all the golf courses seem to like tiny, tiny designs. And the Solheim Cup design here was uh, no exception. And so that was my first challenge. The other was that they wanted to do this um, crystal cup and really make it look like a crystal cup. And, you know, it really is not a lot of room when the thing is so tiny to do much with it. I was actually do a, 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 a sort of an abbreviated blend with the two two different colors of rayon, a white and a, and a gray to start with uh, on the on the fill of the cup. And then uh, I wanted to get somehow capture the uh, crystal look. And um, I, I first experimented, I tried with 60 weight black thread for doing the detail and it looked okay, but it really just didn't look like a crystal cuff. I mean, no crystal cuff has black detail in it. <laughs> so rather than uh, kind of start over, I thought, you know, I think I'll just try this FS50 and just see what it does uh, in the detail stitching. And I was really flabbergasted at how much it brought to life this uh, the crystal look in this thing. And the, the lady at the LPGA just absolutely loved it, and they put this in production. The um, other parts of this design, though, I wanted to point out, too, is that the little stars in the flags um, were done in 60-weight rayon. Um, I think they're really, really tiny. I, I, I don't think I could tell you an exact measurement, but, but it's probably less than uh, 2 millimeters at the top one, the top star on either side. And there's um, the lettering itself. I This was when 75-weight first came out, and uh, while I, I didn't indicate that for these folks to use, um, because I didn't think they'd have it yet. It was brand new, and I think I was just in the testing phase. When I did the sew out, I thought it would be fun to try it. So I used 75 weight here, and it came out really, really sharp. Or when they did it in production, of course, they used 60 weight, which is still the, the thread choice to use for small lettering like this. But uh, overall, these folks are really excited about the quality of this, and uh, it made me look good, so I guess I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, I'd love to point out, too, that Rich has said several times that he played around. Folks, play around. This is something to test with. Uh, as you can see, sometimes the best things we discover is when we, you know, we lose the fear, since that's one of the things we're talking about as the goal in this webinar is to lose your fear, to try something new, to make some changes. This is something that sets Rich apart, and it sets me apart sometimes with the things I've done. It's because we're, we've tried, we play, we get out there and test these new things and see what they can do. And that's something that I really think you guys should do and something that Rich does very well, obviously. Well, thank you. I think it's uh, part of the reason why this, this uh, 
uh, occupation is so darn fun. It's it, you just you never stop learning. I mean, I I've been doing this for a long, long time, and it seems like I learn something new every day. Here's an example of comparing uh, actually two specialty threads: the FS Metallic 50 and the and the classic Rayon 60. And these both these designs were done by Bonnie. And again, you know, depending upon what your customer uh, wants or what you want to be able to present to them, uh, here's a couple of options. And uh, this is one thing that I think both Eric and I would encourage you to do is is to sew out some samples that you can show your customers. And this shows them a couple of things. One, the versatility that you have to offer in terms of a variety. You're just not the ordinary embroiderer out there that slaps some regular thread in there and, and stitches something out. You actually you know, can offer some variety and some exciting differences that can really make your customer happier than they would if they went somewhere else. And so this helps you set yourself apart from everyone else. As you can see, there's a different look here. I mean, you've got the sparkly look from the FS50 on the left, and then you've got the beautiful shine of the Rayon 60 on the right. But the detail is all there. The small lettering is there. The, the detail and the, um, I don't know whether that's a, a deer or whatever that is, but I mean, it's, it's just beautiful. And, and uh, by showing these examples, like I said, is a great way for you to see for yourself, but also to show your customers. Stan, quickly answer one question. This is actually the same design. Um, it wasn't changed for either of the threads. It's just showing the different look, um, the FS50 metallic versus classic rayon 60. And it's very hard to see in the photograph, but there are the words live and brand down underneath the, uh, the deer um, that I don't think would be possible with 40 weight. Uh, this uh, particular design was done by Bonnie Nielsen over in Germany, and uh, the the point I'd like to make here is if you look at this artwork on the left, this uh, cat, I guess that's a capital D. Boy, that sure sure got a lot of stuff in it to look like a D. But you know, someone's logo, and they're really happy with it, really uh, pleased with it. And their challenge, they evidently approached uh, Bonnie and said, you know, we really want to be able to pull this thing off, and we just haven't found anybody that can really do it very well, and so. You know, Bonnie took it on herself to uh, create this wonderful design. And as we do as digitizers, and I'm sure Eric's the same way, we take a look at the artwork and we do some measuring. And a lot of times we have to simplify first because there are limitations in embroidery. I mean, as far as I know, I haven't been able to get ink to come out of my embroidery machine yet. And, I'll, and yet I think there's an awful lot of customers out there that think we can. And, you know, we're dealing with needle and thread. So we have certain limitations. And so part of that process in doing a design as digitizers is we have to make a call about, okay, what is possible and what's not possible. If we try to throw the kitchen sink in every design, we're going to end up falling on our face. So rather than do that, we want to maintain the integrity of a, of a person's logo. So what we try to do is simplify but maintain the look. In other words, we might remove a couple of these fine lines like Bonnie did in this capital D, but still obviously show the shape and the letter as it was intended to look. And I think she did an absolutely marvelous job of doing that. And that's part of the digitizing process that is often overlooked, though, is, is the, the graphic design part of it, where you use a graphics program and you can actually make some adjustments in, in the uh, design and, and see and show your customer what is possible and what will look what it will look like. I often do that for uh, most of my designs. If I get a real complicated design, I'll do a um, simplification and then I'll fire back a low back low resolution JPEG so they can see what it looks like and say, okay, this is what I can do and this is the size that it's going to be. And then that way the customer gets a feel for what it's going to be before I start, so uh, they understand what we're going to do. Uh, here on the right, you can see what her results are, and she did an actual sew out with. Uh, FS50 metallic and the D, and then down below she used the classic Rayon 60. And again, it's a different kind of look. So she was able to offer a customer the bling side of the FS50 or just the detail aspect in a different kind of look with the Rayon 60. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out, and this is this takes a, this is a real specialty digitizing technique, but the small lettering Daniel Hansen is done in running stitch lettering, which typically is not ideal for creating lettering, but when you get down to really, really tiny letters, and in this case, these letters have such thin lines to them, that's the only way that you can create this design, and I think she did a marvelous job. Just a kind of a quick note, but the way that's created is it's actually 
that those letters, Daniel Hansen, all that is double stitched, meaning she traveled all the way through the letter and then back again so that it's two passes of a running stitch, never more than twice, just once or twice, two passes all together to create that look. And she just did a marvelous job, I think. This is another logo that when you see it in person, it, it is really amazing. Um, Bonnie was a kind of a sitting duck. Madeira it was in a trade show in Germany, and they were approached by the Daniel Hansen Company, which is a upscale clothing company, and asked to reproduce their, their logo in, in embroidery, and this is what she came up with. So thank you for, for explaining that. Um, let's take a look at Frosted Matt. Eric, would you share your knowledge of this Absolutely. with us? Absolutely. Uh, the frosted mat is really interesting because it is truly the only matte finish embroidery thread out there. Uh, and as you can see, it doesn't have that shine of rayon or polyester, but sometimes it's something you really want. I know I do a lot of work that is meant to emulate handwork, and also some of that work I showed you earlier um, with that fine sort of uh, woodcut or embroidery or uh, woodcut embroidery or em engraving feel, I would say. Uh, and those things really benefit sometimes from having a little less shine. In fact, that's the first thing I thought when I saw that frosted mat, that it would be perfect because honestly, sometimes on the single color work, you get a little bit too high a shine on the top of the stitch and too much shadow on the penetrations between stitches so that things tend to look, uh, for lack of a better term, stitchy. And I know that sounds funny, but I've had customers tell me that before when I do single line work that way, that, hey, this looks stitchy. Well, with the frosted mat, I found that it actually reduced that look and made things a little more even. Um, you've got a, a lot of color selection here as with the other threads. You've got fluorescent colors and uh, you can use the density just like you would with a regular 40 weight thread though it does run like we said a little bit finer. As you can see in the uh, commercial logo that's up in the upper right hand corner here all these designs are by Bonnie Nielsen also. Um, it is very fine and that matte finish tends to give kind of a very flat but very clean look to the logos and I can see places where that would be useful. Certainly for me it's more in the kind of folk embroidery, bohemian embroidery, which I think is a lot like what's there in the bottom left and right. In that bottom left hand uh, piece with the tessellated lizards, you can really see how she got into te texture and then using multiple passes of thread to make those big thick lines that look like hand embroidery. Um, the fact that it also has uh, it color fastens to UV and it stands at commercial laundering, that's you know just another bonus for using this. So if it's, you're somebody like me who's doing this for, uh, you know, uniforms or commercial aspects, stuff where you're going to have that commercial laundry and bleaching, that's, it's a good thing that you can just swap this right in for the usual polyester you use. Not only is it, um, will it hold up to bleach, but the frosted mat was designed with outdoor use in mind, so it is meant to hold up to sunlight, it is particularly color fast, and is a choice for embroiders for, that are doing patio cushions, boat covers, tire covers, things like that. Something I'll have to test out here in the Great Southwest. Yeah, exactly. You're in a good place to try it. Rich, not so much, but Eric, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and here's another example of the Frosted Matte 40. And like I was telling you, this is exactly what I thought it would be great for. This is a design that I did for a customer who's a little worried about getting all the detail that was present in this piece. And this is a very small piece. I know earlier we saw it in scale with the dime, but a dime fits inside of that little notch there just with a little bit of room. Um, in fact, the first thing that I noticed when I pulled this thing off of the machine was that I slapped the dime on there, and my wife got ready to take the pictures, and I noticed that the text in that billboard that's on top of the building there, the orchards, um, not only could I read it very clearly, and in fact, uh, depending on the light, it can get even clearer. This is kind of hot light that we were in that was putting a little more shine than you actually see. Um, it was clear, clean, and you could, it was smaller than the Liberty type that was pressed into the dime. And when I noticed that, I was like, that's, that's fantastic. That 40 weight uh, frosted mat does run a little thinner, a little tighter. And as you can see, like I talked about with reducing the kind of shadows and making a smoother look, you can see that it's a very smooth look. The fill stitches that are in the barn roof there, they're very smooth, very flat, and though usually I'm one who talks about dimension and embroidery and I'm always trying to say, you know, use that shine, every once in a while you have something like this kind of piece, like this traditional red work, maybe like I said, the bohemian pieces where you want it to look like it's something flat, like it's something that is more akin to a rustic thread, but you don't want to necessarily have to change your logo up, change your needle, do the rest of the things you would have to do if you're using a thick or, a, or another kind of specialty thread. The frosted mat actually allows you to go ahead and digitize as you would for 40 weight and get that frosted look and that matte finish. And let me tell you, out in the sunlight, this is full sun that we're taking the shot in. It was amazing that it maintained that matte finish and that it was uh, just a very solid, even color that looked quite a bit like printing. I mean, maybe we can't get uh, ink to come out of our machines like Rich said, but 
the frosted mat actually was a very smooth look that was the closest to approximating as I've seen. Now with that printing, it, it almost looked like an etching the first time I saw it. It was it was an amazing. Um, this is another piece that when you see it in person, it looks so um, incredible that it came out of a embroidery machine. Now the other thing that I like to point out as a digitizer, I can really appreciate the fact that it probably all sewed with with no trims. It ran the whole thing in one pass. Is that Absolutely. right, Eric? Absolutely. That's one unbroken line, no trims, nothing <laughs> else. It starts at one point and ends at the same point. It would be fun to watch that so. Eric, let's um, let's start out now. Um, where I see we're we're conscious of the time. We're trying not to keep people past an hour, but we've we've kept a lot of the nitty gritty part to the end. And I'm hoping that people will stay with us. Again, we will have this information available to you, but um, Rick, Rich, and and Eric will be off to other projects. So, if let's go into digitizing now. If you could share some of the um, specifics, I think this will answer many of the questions that have come in. Okay, okay, well, I'll start here. You want me to start here? I think, or uh, on, um, on the unreal. Eric. Well, all I was going to say is that uh, if if you're having digitizing done out of your shop, certainly talk to your digitizer ahead of time about thin threads because they need to know how to run them and what densities to run them at and digitize for them and to specify them in the instructions when they do that. Um, but if you do your own digitizing, here are some points to, uh, to that you should really keep in mind, and I think Rich is going to start us out with underlay. Sorry, I jumped ahead there. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about underlay is the first thing we're going to talk about, and, and that's I think it's, it's important to know for especially small lettering, always use underlay. Underlay is, is something I've seen sometimes done without in small lettering, and I think it's probably because people tend to try to use the programmed auto densities, or excuse me, auto underlay feature in their software, and that's why I, I manually create, uh, create my own underlay, and that's because that gives you the ultimate control. When you're placing that underlay, you can put it exactly where you want it to. But the underlay itself, not only does it kind of hold the whole letter together, um, and, and by the way, you want the underlay to go completely through the letter before you start actually stitching it. And that, but it also provides some loft or support for the stitches. And this is really important when you're going on something like a, a knit or something that doesn't have a lot of um, uh, material to stitch on. You need something to put those uh, finishing letter stitches on top of. Um, so again, using underlay is important, the right kind of underlay, and try to avoid using auto underlay, but create that uh, yourself. Yeah, just like with the underlay, you want to avoid kind of auto pathing if you can. You want to path correctly as you as you can, and certainly manually is one way to do that right. Uh, if you break your letter into objects when you digitize, that gives you control over what to stitch is first. And the really important thing about this, not only is it the efficient stitching and the efficient movement through the design, but that this keeps you from having excess underlay. A lot of times when you use auto pathing and auto underlay, you'll have some sections with three or four passes as the um, automatic function keeps moving back and forth through the letter to try and make things layer the way that you set them up. Um, if you plan that pathing yourself, you can make a better choice about where the underlay is and how much you use. Proper efficient pathing is really important. Yeah, and I think the, the best point I like to make is just to kind of underscore that is that every stitch counts. And by doing it yourself, by creating the underlay yourself or, or pathing it yourself, you have that total control. Um, and likewise, depending upon what you're sewing on, um, we're going to talk about that here, uh, the more stable the material you're, going to, you're sewing on, obviously you're going to get better results. And I'm sure a lot of you out there have tried sewing a, a same design maybe on denim, and then you turn around and sew it on piquet, and boy, it doesn't look so sharp on the piquet, but it looks okay on the denim. So all that kind of plays into, into uh, how well you're going to accomplish small lettering. But uh, using these uh, finer threads will help, certainly, but obviously keeping in mind what you're sewing on makes a difference too. Uh, absolutely, and in the same den uh, same track, you, know, you need to watch your densities. You want to do test sewing, like we said, calibrate yourself. That's the biggest thing I can send you off with is calibrate yourself to the 60 weight thread. If you're used to that 40 weight, you've got that automatic setting in your head that you might not even know you have about how threads are supposed to look on screen and how they're supposed to stitch. You're going to calibrate yourself to the 60 weight. As the 60 weight is about roughly 25% thinner than a standard, standard uh, 40 weight thread, you can produce elements that are about 25% smaller, and you're going to want to move that density up by you know anywhere between 20 and 30%. I say 25% is a good point between there. Uh, certainly, up your densities a bit. You can bring down your sizes a bit, but calibrate yourself. Do testing. When you do this, that testing and get that framework, it's going to help you to be able to do this reliably on all your designs. And uh, 
the next step here is uh, in regards to uh, small lettering is is the little tiny openings. I mean, we talked about that in some of the examples we had earlier, but the biggest problem we have with small letters is the, the little openings tend to close up. So I use I, I talk about what's called the one millimeter rule. And, and while we can break that rule slightly with some of these finer weight threads, um, it's a good rule to follow in general in that you want the small openings, you want the column widths that create the letters, you want all those to at least be a millimeter wide because actually when you're digitizing them, I like to make them even a little wider than one millimeter and the reason for that is when it actually sews out, they're going to shrink up so it'll be actually less than one millimeter to start with. But uh, usually the problems that you see with small lettering is they, and why they look so bad is that either the small openings are closed up or the, the columns that make up those letters tend to be too thin and so it doesn't look very good. And by the way, you can use the same principle uh, by e on an editing keyboard lettering. So if you've got keyboard lettering and you do a test cell and it doesn't look so sharp, try fattening up those columns, try opening up those little small openings um, and you'll, you'll be amazed at how much better it looks. Absolutely. I mean, just like with any design, you really have to look at where those obstacles and opportunities are. And what I say about that is you should suggest detail and you should simplify your art. Don't slavishly recreate the detail. With pieces that become too cluttered and dense, like the grading style pieces I showed before, or shaded pieces, or just pieces where lettering, where elements get too close together, um, you're going to have to measure between those details to see where your finished kind of density is. Just like you know with a 48 thread, that 0.4 millimeters between them, if, if the threads are that far apart, those threads are touching. That's going to be a fill. Same thing with your elements. If they're that far apart, they're going to be touching. Measure and then skip lines, reduce some of the detail, move things apart where you can to get some of that openness and preserve the balance between the ground and the stitching. Okay, and I think one of the things that uh, we've kind of stressed on but uh, and made a point of, and that is using the, the correct needle for the type of thread that you're using. And these specialty threads, again, allow us to use finer needles, which, which is great. Um, but the other thing, too, and I, I have to confess that I'm probably one of those that I forget to change my needles as often as I should. And I think probably the, the best rule of thumb is when you've got an important job to do or something coming up, you're going to load the machine up and run it. Um, you know that's a good good excuse to change the needles so that you make sure you have fresh needles even if it's you know for a regular 40 weight thread um, you'll want to use fresh needles because needles do wear out but uh, it's important to use the right size needle so we've talked about that size 8 for 75 weight size 9 for 60 weight I use size 10 for caps you know those are the kinds of things that will help um, <coughs> and also um, like I, I usually have one or two positions on my machines always set up with a size 9 or 10 needle with 60 weight thread. That way I'm not having to worry about changing around. I've always got those available, which makes it really nice if you're a production shop and you want to encourage the use of those. Um, as far as running speed of your machine, um, I have Tajimas and uh, I don't necessarily slow my machines down. I, I guess if some people run their machines at 3,000 stitches per minute, you'd probably want to slow it down a bit, I suppose. Um, I, I'm saying that facetiously because nobody runs their machine at 3,000 stitches per minute. I run mine at 650, and I run that for 40 weight as well as the 60 weight. I don't know about, um, Eric, what, what you guys like to do, but if you're having a little bit of trouble, certainly slowing the machine down probably will help. Um, in terms of tensioning your um, your thread, again, if you want specific numbers, 60 weight thread, I typically run, again, I'm a gauge guy, and I use uh, 100 to 120 grams is, is typically what I set my 60 weight thread uh, tensions to. Uh, regular 40 weight, you'll go up to 120 to 140, um, and poly neon, you go up to 150, even 160. So that kind of gives you an idea where you're supposed to be with the 60 weight thread. You've given me a good reason to dig out my gauges again and get myself familiar. <laughs> uh, certainly, I tension things when we start, but we don't always go there. And we're the same with the speeds, but we tend to run a little faster than you, but not all the way up to the top of the machine. I think that's not always necessary, and we do tend to run a little slower. Um, certainly, in a production shop, people worry about laying into a large stock of colors. And I'll say with this, you, you can start with the basic colors. And especially since lettering is kind of the killer app for this 68 thread and any of the finer threads, I'd say start with your most popular colors for lettering. Certainly, black and white for most people are going to be there. But in our shop, uh, we also run gold and red quite a bit. And I think that's a lot because of the uh, New Mexico flag colors are gold and red. And that's something you see in a lot of our logos. So for us, we laid into a stock of only those four colors. And that's where we're starting. And I think that's the way you can kind of reduce your exposure but still get an idea of what you need to do. 
Now, truthfully, what you're going to have to do if you really want to sell this and make this something that differentiates you, you're going to have to run samples. You can't find a market for the fine threads if you don't show your customers what they're capable of creating. Um, make some samples of the small lettering, make samples of fine detail, and have them prominently available to see in your shop. You don't have to have a big showroom. We do have a big showroom, but even then, we have these little sample books that we take out, and that we can show people uh, different materials, different threads, and how they run. And when you show these people that in person, that's really going to be great, but also show it to them via your marketing, via your media. That fine detail can be a great way to differentiate you from the competition, but you have to show people what it can do. Don't just say you have the fine thread. Show them the sample. You've got to sell the sizzle, not the steak. Show them the results of, that they're going to get. Um, and certainly the last thing to remember with the machines, always keep them tuned and clean. It's not like you don't need to know this for anything else, but I haven't experienced any extra thread breaks with these threads and others I've tried. I haven't had much trouble, but you've got thinner threads. You're going to want to keep everything especially clean. So, and, and you, as you know with metallics too, metallics are, tend to break more often than other threads do just because of the structure that they have. Though I had great luck with the FS50, Part of that's probably also because we keep our thread paths clean, we keep our machines clean, and we maintain things and keep them tensioned well regularly. So definitely don't make that and every once in a while or when something breaks down, keep it tuned, keep it cleaned whenever you can. Yes, and I think uh, here we are with a needle chart here that kind of gives you uh, some specific numbers. Um, again, classic uh, and poly neon 60, size 8 or size 9 needle. Um, 75 weight uh, thread, the new new thread, size 8 needle, which is amazing how small that is. Um, frosted mat, size 8 up to size 11, and of course the FS50, um, size 9 or 11. But these are, you know, kind of just the basics. Again, don't be afraid to experiment. Uh, like I said, when I do caps, I tend to go up in size just because I think it's a uh, uh, it aids in pre preventing needle breaks and again with a thicker material you want to punch a maybe a little bit bigger hole uh, which also will cut down on thread breaks and things but generally speaking the smaller the needle penetration the better because that's that's what you're after but uh, these are these are good uh, a good chart here to go by if you're trying to select what kind of needle to use uh, for the particular specialty thread you're using Thank you, Rich, and, and thank you, Eric. I um, just want to let everybody know we have been collecting all of your questions, and we're going to get them all answered, and we'll be emailing them out to you. Um, we've put together a summary page of what you need to know in order to run these thinner threads. This is a free downloadable PDF, and we'll include a link to find it easily. Um, again, our webinar has been recorded, so you'll find a link on our site. Um, that we will um, take you to the full webinar. It's under the services tab. You just click on videos and webinars and you'll find it there. And if you prefer a printable PDF version, we'll give you a link for that as well. Um, so again, this handout is free and available to all of you. We'll be sending you a link to it in the email that we send out. We'd like to thank our presenters, Eric and Rich. That was a, a monumental job that you did in an hour. That was a tremendous amount of information that you shared with all of us, and we appreciate it. Um, it was valuable information, and I, I think a lot of us have learned a lot today. Um, I want to remind people that are listening that we have um, free downloadable designs on our website. Um, these have been put there specifically for you to try out our 60 and our 75, uh, Frosted Mat, and FS50. Um, they've been digitized specifically for these threads. They'll give you an opportunity to, to get your feet wet and try them out and see what they can do for you. Um, also, if you could watch for a brief survey in your inbox, if you could please give us some feedback on the information that we shared today, um, we'd really appreciate it. And also watch for those questions and answers. I want to thank you. We ran a little bit over the hour, but thank you all so much for your time. Let us know if we can help, and we wish you much success in stitching.